Okay, so it looks like we're just starting to, to get to a full room here. Um, so thanks everybody for coming today. Just a few quick notes. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have a case discussion and then we're gonna have um, some more updates from Croy, from Richard. And um, although I haven't, we, we, we're not exactly sure which, which order that's gonna be in. So stay tuned for the announcement. And then on the 22nd, we're gonna go back to our CME course with some hepatitis C or hepatitis lectures. So, um, and also please feel free to forward me any requests to discuss research projects. We can get in a few minutes at the beginning and we'll probably hear from uh, Bob and Janet Silicano next week about a project they're working on. Okay, great. So today we are super lucky to have Dr. Christine Duran who it requires no introduction to this group, but who is, you know, had some very exciting expansion in her work recently and is the co-directing the Johns Hopkins Transplant Research Center, which will, I'm sure, inform many things about the immunology of transplantation, both in people living with HIV and people without HIV. But we're really thrilled to have her here today to give us an update on solid organ transplantation in people living with HIV, something that she has really um, led the way in, in a national and international way. So thanks so much for being here, Christine. Looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Eileen. And uh, it's a privilege to be here with all of you. Um, let's see. So what I hope to talk about today is uh, I'll spend the beginning talking a little bit about solid organ transplantation and people living with HIV from a clinical care context. Um, and I'll discuss the history of that. Um, and then I'll spend the second half of my talk um, talking about HIV to HIV transplantation which as many of you know, is an area of research for me and the new frontier in transplantation. Um, and I'll just end with some future directions and research questions that we hope to answer. So I'm really just gonna give a single slide on this because I think everyone in this room who takes care of people living with HIV knows this. Um, and that is with our effective antiretroviral therapy and as the people with HIV are living longer, what we see now is an increasing prevalence end stage organ disease. And so this is most notable in terms of kidney disease with an increasing prevalence of end stage renal disease and as well as, well as with liver disease. And so in both of these arenas, we've seen a shift in the causes, but not necessarily a shift in the prevalence. So for end stage renal disease, we're seeing more and more of our traditional causes related to hypertension, cardiovascular disease, rather than HIV direct causes. And in liver disease, now that we have cures for hepatitis C, we're seeing more and more individuals presenting with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But um, in sum total, the epidemiology hasn't changed so much in that the numbers of people who have these end-stage organ complications has, has, if anything, risen as people are living longer. And so what we know in people without HIV is that organ transplantation is really standard therapy once you end up with end-stage organ disease. But for HIV, it's only been in recent years that we've had that therapy and had the evidence to support using that therapy in people living with HIV. So the, the preeminent evidence for this really came from an NIH multicenter consortium that was known as the NIH Transplant Re recipient study, and that was led by Dr. Peter Stock, who's a, a kidney um, and liver transplant surgeon out from UCSF, and he published his um, first results from that study in 2010. So these are the results of the kidney transplantation NIHTR study, and it included 150 individuals living with HIV who had well-controlled disease, so they had viral loads that were suppressed on antiretroviral therapy and CD4 counts, which were greater than 200. Um, they were primarily African-American and had a range of different causes of their end-stage renal disease. So they underwent transplantation at 26 different centers across the United States. And what I'm showing here are the major outcomes, so patient survival on the top and graft survival on the bottom. The cohort of people living with HIV is shown by the gray dotted line. And what you can appreciate here is that it is very similar to the all comers in the scientific registry of transplant recipients. That's the line shown in red. And actually they had better outcomes than people um, without HIV who were over the age of 65, which was sort of an increased risk cohort that they chose to use as their comparator. So overall, the patient survival was 95% at one year, and graft survival was also excellent at 90% at one year. 
so shifting gears, there was also a study done by the same consortium looking at outcomes of liver transplantation. And this group was um, all hepatitis C co-infected individuals. So people living with HIV who also had hepatitis C, not 89 of them. And the comparator group in this case were people who had hepatitis C mono infection that required a liver transplant. Again, the cohort was um, a, a mix of people who were on antiretroviral therapy, as well as some who could not tolerate it because of their end-stage liver disease. And for the most part, they had some degree of Im immune reconstitution with CD4s greater than 100. The threshold was a little bit lower in this cohort because people with liver end-stage liver disease tend to have some artificial lowering of their lymphocyte counts due to splenic sequestration of lymphocytes. So in contrast to the kidney study, um, the outcomes of this study were, were a little bit more discouraging in the sense that those with co-infection did have worse survival than the comparator group, which was hep C mono infection. The one year survival in, in this um, cohort was 76% and at three years, only 60% had survived. And if you looked at, at the graph survival, you can see that that is what explains it. So there was um, in many of these people a recurrence of their hepatitis C, which led to liver failure and ultimately death. However, it's important to remember that these are individuals who had very advanced decompensated liver disease. So their chances of survival without a liver transplant were quite low. And in a later analysis, which really asked the question of, did this provide some survival benefit? The answer was yes, that for those who had advanced liver disease noted by a MELD score, uh, which is a, a severity score for your liver disease greater than 15, this um, transplant still had a survival benefit. And in some uh, registry studies, which were able to look at a group of individuals that just had HIV and ask what were their outcomes of liver transplant, um, they found that really HIV itself in the modern era did not lead to an increased hazard of death with liver transplantation. And importantly, if you think about today where we have cures for hepatitis C, I think um, all of the evidence really supports liver transplantation in this population as the standard therapy for um, those with end stage liver disease. So what this, um, this landmark study showed was that solid organ transplantation is really the standard of care for people living with HIV and kidney and liver disease. And what has been put into clinical practice is essentially the inclusion criteria for the study being the clinical guidelines that we use to um, evaluate individuals for transplant. So if you have someone in your clinical practice who has end-stage um, renal or liver disease, they are an appropriate uh, patient to refer for transplant if they have um, no active opportunistic infections. Um, they can have a history of opportunistic infections, and the only ones that don't have great data because they were excluded from the NIH trial would be those who have a history of um, PML or those who have a history of visceral KS. Um, your, your patient should be on effective antiretroviral therapy with a suppressed viral load. And again, the criteria in terms of CD4 count that were used in this study um, would be for kidney having a CD4 count greater than 200 and a liver um, CD4 count greater than 100. In addition, in order to be a candidate for transplantation, there's quite rigorous general evaluation that involves um, making sure there's no severe underlying cardiovascular disease and um, all sorts of other hoops that our patients have to jump through. But in terms of the HIV specific criteria, this is what um, is required. And so in practice, if you have someone who you believe might be a candidate, you um, should certainly refer them. Um, you can refer them to either myself or Willa Cochran in the HIV clinic and we can help shepherd them through the transplant referral process. Um, but in general, you know, as I've shown, these patients really will have excellent outcomes. We have seen some complications after transplantation that seem to be unique for people living with HIV, and the most significant one is allograft rejection. So if you go back to the NIHTR kidney transplant study, there was up to 40% who had rejection at three years, and this was a three to four-fold higher risk what was seen in the general transplant recipient population. Similarly, for liver transplant, there was a higher rejection rate with 18% at one year and 39% um, at three years. 
So in order to understand what might be underlying this increased complication, it's useful to know a little bit about the immunosuppression that we use after transplant. Um, there are really two phases. The first is what we call induction immunosuppression. And this is a very potent um, phase of immunosuppression that's given immediately following the transplant. For those who get kidney transplantation, the two types of induction that we use are either antithymocyte globulin, which is also known as lymphocyte depleting induction, or um, some centers use IL-2 receptor blockers uh, with a drug known as basiliximab. Um, at Hopkins, we exclusively use antithymocyte globulin. On the liver side, it's uh, typically high dose steroids right after the transplant. And then these individuals will go into a maintenance immunosuppression phase, which essentially is for the rest of their lives. On the kidney transplant side, it's typically a calcineurin inhibitor. Tacrolimus is the standard that's used in this population with steroids and mycophenolate mofetil. And on the liver side, um, again, it can be a calcineurin inhibitor or an mTOR inhibitor such as serolimus or everolimus. So when we saw this increased rejection in the first NIH transplant recipient study, many people thought that potentially the explanation was drug interactions. So um, at this phase of the epidemic, a lot of individuals were on protease inhibitors for their HIV. And these, as many of you know, are potent CYP3A4 inhibitors, and they interact specifically with tacrolimus. So for people living with HIV who had a transplant and were on protease inhibitors, they had to get very low and infrequent dosing of their tacrolimus, which may have led to underexposure and potentially explains this increased rejection. What this means to us in practice is that we really try to avoid protease inhibitors whenever possible. And so the preferred antiretroviral therapy regimens for a patient who's a potential transplant candidate would be an integrase inhibitor based regimen. CCR5 antagonists are also okay. Um, NNRTIs that don't have potent CYP3A4 induction like rilpivirine or duraverine would be preferred. And then in particular for our kidney transplant recipients, we try to avoid um, TDF and would prefer TAF containing regimens just to avoid any additional nephrotoxicity. So um, that's really where we are in terms of standard of care for our patients these days. And what this has led to um, with these encouraging outcomes is just an increase in the overall um, demand for transplantation in this population. So I'm showing you here just the um, rise in number of transplants performed since 2001 in people living with HIV. On the left are the numbers in kidney transplant and on the right in liver transplant. In the setting of this increased demand, however, the organ um, shortage remains. And for people with HIV in particular, that shortage um, has even more dire consequences. So people with HIV on the transplant wait list have higher mortality than those without HIV. And um, they also have been shown to have lower access and, and fewer offers for transplant. So in light of this, um, there really was an urgency to find novel donor sources. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk about HIV positive donors as an innovative approach to address that shortage. So really, this was pioneered in South Africa, where the situation was even more dire because people in South Africa living with HIV didn't have access even to dialysis. So um, back before 2010, Dr. Elmi Mueller, who was a renal transplant surgeon there, um, started doing these transplants using organs from uh, donors with HIV who died at her hospital. And she presented the first four cases in the New England Journal in 2010, showing in encouraging early results, and then um, more recently in 2015 actually showed good results at three to five years. So when her early publication came out in 2010, this really prompted a renal transplant um, surgeon here at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Dori Segev, to look at this. Dr. Segev is also an epidemiologist and a transplant policy expert, and he was looking at this from the scope of a federal ban that had happened in the United States early in the HIV epidemic, which made it illegal to do HIV to HIV transplantation here. Encouraged by Dr. Mueller's results, he decided to look at what type of impact it would have if this federal ban could be reversed. And this work was done um, by Brian Boyarski, who at the time was a postback student with Dr. Segev and is now a surgery resident here at Johns Hopkins. 
He worked with Kelly Gibo to look at some of the National Registry data to estimate how many donors with HIV might be appropriate and eligible for donation if, if this federal ban was lifted. They found there could be as many as 500 additional donors each year, and this was um, sufficient evidence to really prompt lobbying for a change um, on the federal ban on Capitol Hill, um, and, and Brian Boyarski himself spent many hours in uh, lobbying with, with senators on the Hill. And this was successful, leading to the unanimous passage of the HIV Oregon Policy Equity Act, or the HOPE Act, in 2013. Um, so what the HOPE Act did was it allowed for these transplants to occur, but only under research protocols. The reason it was restricted is that there were thought to be significant potential risks, such as HIV superinfection, and that would be um, the recipient acquiring a second strain of HIV from their organ donor. It was thought that this might jeopardize HIV suppression and, and control with antiretroviral drugs. There was also concerns that HIV positive donors might have occult organ disease that wasn't well recognized. Uh, there are questions about whether there could be increased rejection or increased infection with use of organs from these donors. So finally, the um, federal ban was reversed in 2015, and the NIH also published specific research criteria that really um, put parameters around what research protocols would look like. We opened the first such research protocol in 2016 and in um, March of that year did the first deceased HIV deceased donor kidney and liver transplant. Um, that was the beginning of what we call the HOPE in Action Consortium. So this is a group of transplant centers across the United States who have come together to determine if HIV to HIV transplantation is feasible and effective. Um, in addition, to doing transplant outcome research. The group has done a significant number of studies looking at ethical, legal, policy, patient reported, and social outcomes. And um, the group has completed both a pilot kidney and liver study. And um, has also been, we've also been funded by the NIH to do larger trials um, of kidney and liver, which are ongoing. So today, the Hope in Action Consortium consists of 35 different transplant centers across the United States. You can see there's many in our area. So Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland here in Baltimore both are, are participants, but there's also many centers uh, primarily on the East Coast. As I mentioned, um, the group has done pilot studies in both kidney and liver. The kidney study included 75 uh, kidney transplants at 14 centers and the liver study 45 transplants at nine centers. Both of these have been completed and um, the, the results published, so I'm, I'll be happy to share the data with you today um, on, those, on those studies. In both studies, uh, we compared outcomes for people living with HIV who had po HIV positive donors versus those who had HIV negative donors. So if we start with the kidney transplant study. Um, again, this included 75 kidney transplant recipients, 25 received donors, um, organs from donors with HIV. And overall, the survival was excellent. So there were no deaths on the study, 100% survival in both arms. And in addition, the graft survival, that is the ability to stay off dialysis was excellent with greater than 90% and no difference in the two arms. Overall, we did not see many opportunistic infections and there were no differences in the two groups. You can see of the infections that we did see, these were primarily CMV viremia or esophageal candidi candidiasis, both of which are, are pretty standard and fairly easily managed post-transplant. We did not see significant numbers of HIV breakthroughs. There were four total on the trial, and these were all actually attributed to individuals who had had an interruption in their antiretroviral therapy, either due to um, insurance access or um, temporary noncompliance. And then um, also very few malignancies in the study and excellent one-year kidney function. What we did see was high rates of allograft rejection, similar to what was seen in the original NIH study. 36% um, had an episode of serious rejection during the study. And at least four of these were um, the uh, primary reason for graft failure as well. If we drill down a little bit more on the reason 
on, on some of the factors that were associated with rejection, there was a trend to having more rejection if you received a kidney from an HIV positive donor. You can see here the hazard was uh, 1.83 in that group, and that was trending towards significant. However, this risk did seem to be um, significantly associated with the type of induction immunosuppression that you received. So if you remember, I mentioned there's really two main types you can get immediately after transplant. And for those who received antithymocyte globulin, also known as lymphocyte depleting induction, they had a significantly lower rate of serious rejection at 21%. And so I think um, we're still trying to figure out what might be driving this. As I mentioned, it was uh, thought in the NIH that perhaps the biggest contributor was drug-drug interactions and ritonavir specifically driving some of this. Um, and that very well may have been the case in the NIH study where 42% of the participants were on ritonavir. But in this pilot study that we did in Hope and Action, only 8% of our participants were on ritonavir, and this did not seem to be um, significantly associated with rejection. So I think a remaining question is whether this might be due to increased allo-reactivity in people living with HIV. Again, that might be supported by the observation that we see lower rates if the site depleting induction is used. We know there's um, a lot of evidence that there's, uh, there's con continued immune dysregulation in people living with HIV, even when they're on antiretroviral therapy. Um, and this observation that perhaps having an HIV positive donor leads to the question of whether you know, virus in the allograft is potentially driving some kind of allo, allo reactive response. So more to come. Shifting gears now for the Hope and Action liver pilot. Um, this included 45 liver transplant recipients at nine centers. 24 of these transplant recipients had HIV positive donors and 21 negative donors. And the um, median meld for individuals going into the transplant was 20. These are the overall outcomes. And as you can see in the first graph up on the upper left, um, the overall survival was 100% in the HIV negative donor um, liver transplant recipients and 83% in those who received a positive donor. And this difference was statistically significant. We didn't see any differences in rejection. There were no differences in these um, incidents of serious adverse events in the two groups and no differences in HIV breakthrough. But there were more opportunistic infections and cancers in those who received HIV positive donors. So looking a little more closely at what these looked like, um, the opportunistic infections, there were primarily CMV. And so this, um, there were actually nine episodes of CMV among seven participants. Most of these were viremia only, but there were two episodes of colitis. So post-transplantation, CMV is the most um, common infection that we see. And so while this um, finding did merit, you know, concern, it wasn't overall something that, that couldn't be managed. Um, we did also see a higher incidence of cancer, however. Um, you can see there were eight episodes of cancer overall. And in addition to um, recurrent liver cancer, one of the other most common cancers, which was more of a surprise, was HHV-8 related cancers, at least one of which was um, a fatal case of cancer in someone who developed a very rare diffuse large B cell lymphoma that was HHV-8 related, and they also developed concomitant KS. So I think this is an area that we need to understand better. Um, certainly, we know HHV-8 or Kaposi sarcoma can, the, the acquisition of this can be linked to the, some of the same factors that HIV acquisition is linked to. And so donors with HIV, with HIV are more likely to also be HHV-8 infected. Um, However, I, I will say that although we did find these potential differences between the two groups, the overall survival was still um, better than historical controls. So if you remember in the NIH TR study, the overall survival was 76% at one year. And even in the D plus group of the Hope and Action study it was 83%. And again, um, liver transplant has been shown to have a survival benefit in those with a melt greater than 15 and our cohort had a median melt of 20 going in. So I think both of these studies were very encouraging um, and certainly they are small, they were pilot studies and we are looking forward to learning more from the NIH funded studies.
What about this um, notion of HIV super infection? So again, a, a real concern was that the donor perhaps could have a um, drug resistant strain that could lead to breakthrough or complications in the recipient. Um, to look at this more closely, Tanya Bani, who's a postdoc in um, Andrew Red and Aaron Tobin's lab, looked at donor recipient um, pairs, uh, paired blood samples from 14 of our kidney transplants and eight of our liver transplants. This also included one case of a liver recipient who had a very high level of breakthrough three years after transplant. And she did next generation sequencing, looking at um, HIV re reverse transcriptase and um, the envelope GP31 to see if she could find any evidence of donor sequences in the recipients at um, multiple time points post-transplant. And what she found was there was no evidence of detectable donor-derived superinfection which really aligned with the clinical finding that we did not see high levels of um, breakthrough in our recipients. For the liver recipient who I mentioned did have a high level of viremia three years post-transplant, this was found to be their own um, recipient reactivation. And this um, individual had been off all of their antiretroviral therapy, which was the, the explanation for that. So as I mentioned, we're looking forward to, to learning more from the larger studies that um, uh, were, are being funded by the NIH. The kidney study is now fully enrolled with 200 individuals. The last patient last visit will be in September of this year. So we'll do an analysis after that, potentially learn more about rejection and some of those other complications. And our liver study is um, at, has enrolled 55 individuals with a target enrollment of 80 and so more to come. So I wanted to just go back to the donors and, and talk a little bit about what we have um, found on, on that end in terms of numbers and um, also some of the immunologic and virologic characteristics. So just starting uh, as far as numbers overall, since the HOPE Act implementation in 2016, there have been 150 HOPE donors. And you can see here, um, there's been a number of both true positive donors as well as what we call HIV false positive donors. So what's an HIV false positive donor? This was a bit of a surprise and sort of an unexpected benefit of the HOPE Act, but as part of organ transplantation, any potential donor is tested for HIV um, with two assays, both an antibody and a nucleic acid test. And we found early on that there were donors who had no history of HIV, no risk factors for HIV, and they had one of these tests positive. So either a antibody positive or nucleic acid positive, but it's discordance. And in, in real time, of course, we suspected that these were false positive um, results on these assays, and we were able to confirm that um, in the lab. So prior to the HOPE Act, when this would happen in practice, the cases were shut down. No one wanted to have even the, the remote possibility of, a, of an infection from, from transplant, but under the HOPE Act, it was very easy to place these organs into people living with HIV who were consented to under a research protocol. And so because we, we screen so many donors um, each year, for example, in 2016, we screened more than 23,000 donors. There's actually a significant number of these false positive donors that we would expect. And this can be predicted just looking at the false positive rates of the antibody and the nucleic acid test that we use for screening. Um, so when we looked at this, we would anticipate about 50 to 100 false positive donors each year. So looking at the donors that have been used to date in the HOPE Act, Bill Warble here at Hopkins did a much deeper dive into the immunologic and virologic characteristics of the first 92 donors that we used. Um, so these donors collectively gave 177 organs. 29% um, of them were discovered to have HIV just during the donor evaluation. And then of the 71% that had a known history of HIV, the vast majority were on antiretroviral therapy and uh, the, most of those individuals had suppressed viral loads. So this is actually in contrast to what um, Dr. Elmi Mueller sh showed in her South Africa population where the vast majority of the donors that um, she used in her cohort were antiretroviral naive. Here in the US, um, we have much more uh, treatment experience in our cohort. If you look at the clinical characteristics um, between the HIV positive and the false positive group, there were not 
too many major differences. However, I'll just draw your attention to the seroprevalence of CMV. And you can see here the HIV positive donors, more than 90% of them are CMV IgG positive, which might explain some of the post-transplant infections that we see. Looking at the immunologic characteristics of these donors, um, this is a scatter plot here of their CD4 counts, the absolute counts shown on the x-axis and the CD4% is on the y-axis with each, each point representing one donor. As you can see, the, the median CD4 was 194, um, which seems low, but if you actually look at the median CD4%, it was discordantly high, so about 27%. Um, so this is reassuring in the sense that these donors uh, altogether don't seem to be profoundly immunosuppressed or have very advanced immunosuppression. The discordance is likely related to the fact that many deceased donors get steroids as part of their, um, their end of life hospitalization. So many of these donors are brain death donors and, and steroids are just part of standard care. So we think that that's what's explaining this discordance. Um, of course, the other big question about the safety of using organs from these donors is antiretroviral resistance. We know, um, you know, as I mentioned, these are, are primarily treatment experienced donors in contrast to South Africa. And we also know that in the United States, there's an increasing prevalence of drug resistance. Um, so what, what uh, Bill found, and this was done in conjunction with Aaron Tobin and folks in the virology lab was that antiretroviral resistance was quite common with being found um, in more than 40% of the donors. However, the patterns of the drug resistance were reassuring. So primarily what um, Bill saw was there was NRTI resistance with M184V being the most common or NNRTI resistance in about a third with K103N and um, V179D, the most common mutations. So I think that's what we would expect. Um, we know that there's primary resistance now because there's so much access to ART in the US, um, but we did not find high prevalence of integrase inhibitor resistance or multi-class resistance. And all of this was you know, very reassuring because in real time, we need to make a judgment call about whether or not our recipient's antiretroviral therapy is going to be effective um, in these cases. And I think this data um, from Bill really reassures us. So, as I told you earlier in this talk, um, Brian Boyarski had estimated that we could have as many as 500 potential HIV donors each year. Why are we not really seeing that in practice? Um, we're seeing more like 40 HIV donors a year. And I think to understand this, we need to look a little more closely at the different pieces of the organ donation and transplant um, system in the United States. And so we've tried to ask, um, look at this from a few different perspectives. First, you know, you have to have donors living with HIV who are willing to donate. Second um, are the organizations that actually go out and find these donors and evaluate these donors. These are the organ procurement organizations. Then the organs are offered and need to be accepted by transplant centers. And finally, the candidates at the centers also have to be willing to accept them. So we first asked if people living with HIV perhaps were not willing to donate organs. And this work was done by Queen Nguyen, who's a, who was a med student here at Hopkins. Um, she did a survey at our own Bartlett Clinic among 114 individuals to ask them about their knowledge of the HOPE Act and what they thought about organ donation. So what she found was there were actually very high rates of willingness to be deceased donor, uh, to, to donate organs among this population, 80%. However, only 21% of individuals were actually registered donors. So what this suggested to us was that there is a lag, a lag and, a, and a gap in the willingness of actually being able, being registered and being able to donate um, that could be addressed perhaps through more education and outreach. What about organ procurement organizations? So I mentioned that these are the um, organizations that go into hospitals and evaluate donors. There are 58 of these organizations and they're nonprofits. They roughly correspond to the different states across the United States. And in the beginning, um, in 2016, only 16 of these organ procurement organizations were actually receiving and following up on referrals of donors that had HIV. Um, with some uh, increased engagement, efforts and education in 2021, this number has significantly increased. 
Um, however, there, there are barriers that are definitely experienced at the OPO level. We know this from work that was done here um, by Zach Predmore, who's a PhD student in health policy, and he did this work with um, Dr. Albert Wu. He did semi-structured interviews with OPO staff, and he found that it wasn't a um, lack of knowledge or a lack of education that the OPO staff had a very high level of knowledge about the HOPE Act itself. But there were multiple operational um, barriers that were identified. OPO staff noted having um, difficulty obtaining authorization for research since these, these transplants are still happening under research protocols. There were also concerns about these newly discovered HIV cases, how to disclose to families. Some state laws were still prohibiting this practice despite the reversal of the federal ban. And there were financial concerns about how many um, organs they could uh, recover and, and place from these donors, as well as some concerns about fear of HIV infection and, and perhaps some ongoing HIV stigma. Zach followed up on this finding with what's called a discrete choice experiment. And so this was a, um, a way to try to quantify how uh, significant a barrier the HIV status of the donor might be in influencing the decision of OPOs to pursue a particular donor. So he, um, again, did uh, worked with 36 of the different, uh, 36 of the 58 OPOs and had 51 staff um, respond to this discrete choice experiment. I've shown you a little picture of what it might look like up in the upper right corner. So staff were presented uh, a series of potential donors and asked to choose which one they would pursue. What this allowed him to do was to quantify the influence of seven different donor characteristics. And um, what he found was that HIV status was an influencer. It was more important than, for example, hepatitis C, more of a deterrent um, for pursuing a donor. And um, the, the quantification that, that he ended up showing was that in order for a donor with HIV to be pursued equally as an HIV negative donor, they had to have the potential to um, have two additional organs um, compared to their HIV negative donor counterpart. This makes it difficult under the HOPE Act because right now it's really just kidney and livers that are being used. So out of the gate, a donor with HIV to an OPO has less organ potential. What about transplant centers? Um, so Sarah Van Pilsen Rasmussen did a survey of most of the US transplant centers. She had a good survey response and she found that 50 of them were planning HIV to HIV transplant protocols. However, I already told you that only 35 actually have protocols. So that's a minority of the US transplant centers that are actually offering this practice. Some other potential barriers is that these centers are primarily on the East Coast. Most of them are kidney and liver only. And these transplant centers indicated that they were concerned that their candidates with HIV would not be willing to accept organs from a donor with HIV. So what about that? We had a research assistant, Shanti Seaman, who worked with our Hope and Action Protocol, our Hope and Action Consortium to see if that was the case. She did a survey at, at nine of the centers um, and talked to 116 transplant candidates who were who had HIV and were actually facing this decision themselves and asked them what their thoughts were about donors with HIV. She found that more than 80% were willing to accept a donor with HIV. The vast majority were supportive of donation for people living with HIV. And 88% actually thought they'd be likely to get an organ faster if they accepted an HIV positive donor organ. As far as potential concerns or challenges, um, only about 30% were concerned that they might have a complication such as HIV super infection. So willingness does not seem to be um, a huge barrier, at least in the um, transplant centers and transplant candidates that we have, we have reached out to. So what about the next frontiers? I think one very exciting area um, and possibility under the HOPE Act is that people living with HIV can now donate their be living donors. And the first such um, donation and transplant also occurred here at Johns Hopkins in 2019. This is a picture of Nina Martinez, who was the first um, HIV, first living kidney donor with HIV. 
Um, this, this historic transplant was followed up just six months later by the second HIV living donor kidney transplant, which was done at um, Duke University. And um, the donor is pictured there, um, who's named Carl Newman. And I think what's really unique and special about both of these um, donations is, is that these individuals um, did what's called a non-directed donation. So that is they um, purely donated without knowing who their recipient would be. This was not a paired donation with a spouse or a loved one. Um, and this was you know, purely an act of altruism. And um, this, we thought this was really unique. We also saw this in, um, in Queen's survey of, of uh, people living with HIV at the Bartlett Center, where she found that more than 60% said they would be willing to be a living donor, which is a really high um, rate of willingness. And so we wanted to understand what was, um, you know, driving this, what was motivating people living with HIV. Um, Sarah uh, Rasmussen followed up on her, um, on this survey with doing a more in-depth interviews with these individuals who are willing to be donors. And what she found was that there were some what we call HIV-specific motivations and um, HIV-specific perceived benefits of donation. One of these is um, what we called um, solidarity with the HIV positive recipient. And so this was a sense of solidarity with the community of people living with HIV and something um, beneficial about giving back to that community. There was also this sense that by being a donor, there was an opportunity to break down stigma associated with HIV. Um, there was also this concept of being able to give back borrowed time. So a sense of gratitude at having been a survivor and having this desire to give back. Um, and many people discussed their commitment and obligation to science and wanting to um, move the field forward. This was similarly reflected in what they perceived as the benefit of donation. So again, um, the sense of normalcy and reducing stigma, as well as um, contributing to science. So in conclusion, I hope that you um, are, are all in agreement that kidney and liver transplantation really are considered our standard of care for people living with HIV and end-stage organ disease. This should not be considered a contraindication, and we know that outcomes um, can be just as, as good in this population. HIV to HIV transplantation is really a promising option, and we think it's um, a way to improve access to transplantation, maybe mitigate some of these disparities I talked about. Certainly further studies are needed to really understand the risks of rejection and maybe ways that we can mitigate this in HIV to HIV kidney transplant. And then in the setting of liver transplantation, I think we need to better understand and, and quantify these risks of cancer and infection in a larger cohort. Finally, I think living donation is one of the next frontiers and there seems to be unique motivations and, and potential benefits for donors. Um, we, will, we look forward to, to having larger numbers so that we can really access, assess long-term outcomes in this population. So this work really is, um, you know, credited to uh, a really large group of individuals, both at Johns Hopkins and beyond. I especially want to give um, credit to Dr. Dori Segev, who's the transplant surgeon who started um, the HOPE Act, and also Aaron Tobin, who is um, a protocol chair on the co-chair on these with Dr. Segev and myself, and runs our our Open Action Core Lab. There's a number of individuals in epidemiology, surgery, um, our clinical coordinating center, our ethical team, virology, immunology, pathology, nephrology, and hepatology who um, really have been involved in these cases. And then finally, there are centers across the United States, as I mentioned, more than 30 who are doing these transplants and um, contributing to this data, and none of this work could be done without them. So I will stop there. I'm very happy to take any questions and um, hear from, from folks if you have any comments or, or questions for me. Thank you so much, Christine, that was awesome. I see Andrea had a, put a question in the chat. Andrea, do you just wanna unmute or I can read it? I mean, I can, I can ask it. Um, Christine, I was just wondering, I'm a little bit um, surprised by the, um, increase in CMV viremia 
with respect to the donors, and I don't know if there's a difference in the prophylaxis protocol, but I'm wondering if there's a baseline difference in CMV positivity in the donors between the two groups that might in part explain that difference. Yeah, exactly. I, I think Bill showed that in his um, landscape of HIV donor study, the, the po CMV positivity rate in, in donors with HIV is upwards of 90%. And in our um, HIV negative donors, it's more fi like 50 to 60%. Um, I will say that most, almost all of these cases occurred in CMV D plus R minus recipients. So these were the few people living with HIV who were CMV seronegative and received a seropositive donor. They also tended to happen um, late. So after prophylaxis, um, CMV prophylaxis is standard for three months in our R plus population, in our R plus population, and six months in our R minus population. So they were happening in people late who were off prophylaxis, who were CMV discordant, and uh, for the most part recognized early and, and very easily managed. Um, Thanks, very exciting work. It's very cool to see what you've done in this field. Thanks, Andrea. Christine, this is awesome. There's a, a bunch of people saying in the chat how incredible this is and how the fact that this is something that we can do for our patients is just amazing. Um, totally second and co-sign that. Um, I was just wondering if there's any, um, because in part the siliconos are on the call, like for patients who are, are organ donors, has there ever been ever been approached to use tissues more similar to the um, uh, the project done out of UCSD, the last gift type project to look at reservoirs and tissues that are not used for transplantation. A like a very different type of question, but like for the donor who's consented to donate organs, has there ever been thought of adding on because, you know, the, the work with the last gift project, which is patients who are near the end of life and are being cared for near the end of life, actually plan to donate at the time of death for reservoir tissue studies. Yeah. And I just wonder if that would be feasible for some of these uh, patients as well. So I, I can't say within our cohort for the donors. Um, I, I see Ashwin's on the call. I don't know if Aaron, um, if Aaron Tobin's on the call, but we are um, collecting lymph nodes from uh, both recipients and in some cases, the donors. But as part of the HOPE Act, a organ and allograft biopsy is required. So before the transplants, a back, we call it a back table biopsy. So before the organ goes into the recipient. So Ashwin um, Balagopal and uh, Abraham Contadel are looking at the liver biopsies to better understand um, you know, the, the viral burden in hepatocytes and um, Aaron, Tobin, Andrew Red, I think actually just, just got us successfully got an R01 to better study the lymph nodes um, and whether or not that's really a, a reservoir. Um, there's, as far as, you know, with, with Bob and Janet on the phone, with uh, on the call, um, there's, there's work being done to look at reservoirs over time in this population. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll hear more about that um, in the months to come. Awesome. So um, I see Bill had a comment also. You can unmute. Oh, I was just saying, I mean, um, also first again, Christine, obviously really amazing stuff that I've been fortunate to be affiliated with. Um, the something that I've been interested in and wrote part of my research grants and stuff about is this issue with rejection and infections in a specific subgroup of transplant patients uh, and how that probably governs a lot of the excess risk of opportunistic infection because so many people funneled into transplant are people with good you know, HIV control, usually have relatively reconstituted CD4 counts or at least CD4 percentage. Um, and just thinking about ways to break that cycle, um, one of which may be using lymphodepleting induction, as Christine mentioned, you know, upfront powerful immunosuppressants, but of course then that may lead to medium or downstream other issues with opportunistic infections, ironically. Um, so we were just really trying to parse out and develop kind of evidence-based tailored prophylaxis strategies, because again, I've made this point, like what is a CD4 count of 150 in a person with HIV who gets a transplant, maybe from an HIV infected donor, um, 
if they're also on tacrolimus and prednisone, you know, like what is the function of these T cells or, you know, um, and what is the risk window for infections for these folks? I mean, it's just really not well understood because we're either grabbing from the general organ transplant population or the general HIV population, which are neither is exactly the same. You'll tell us in a few years, Bill, I hope. Yeah, maybe 10. And I see Bob and Janet have their hand up. Um, hey, Christine, you know, thank you so much for being a real pioneer in this important area. It's just incredible. Um, so a question, there's a theoretical reason that uh, cyclosporin and rapamycin might sort of differ in their effects on uh, the HIV reservoir. And I wonder, in, in just sort of long-term treatment, which of those drugs is used most? And is there any sort of reason for that and difference in outcome and, and things like that? I'm sure it hasn't been evaluated in terms of the reservoir, but um, I just don't, I'm just not sure which ones are, are, which one is used the most and why. Yeah, I think so. The the early studies looked at tacrolimus versus cyclosporin and showed that tacrolimus was much better at preventing rejection. So that's usually our go-to. I see. Um, but we we sometimes switch pace, patients to serolimus um, in certain cases. And you know, from a clinical perspective, one potential benefit of that is serolimus is actually active against HHV8 and may prevent some of the KS associated complications. So as we, we see if that's more of an issue, that might be um, a, a therapeutic intervention. But, um, you know, I, I know Alyssa Martin in your lab had done some work on, on serolimus and, and um, I believe Steve Deeks also had shown earlier that yeah. potentially mm -hmm. there might be an association mm -hmm. between serolimus and um, HIV reservoirs. But Maybe you could speak to that because I'm forgetting the the details of, of what um, Alyssa showed. Yeah, so so uh, in her in her sort of in vitro HIV reactivation studies, um, reactivation of latent HIV was blocked by cyclosporin, um, but not by mTOR inhibitors. Um, although that's been a little bit controversial in other in other studies. But so there was a theoretical reason to think that you know in the long run there might be some difference in how the reservoir persisted. Yeah, and I and maybe with the IDPA data that Greg Greg is looking at that in this cohort. So um, okay, that, that, we, that would be interesting. You know, yeah. We'll oh. be able to do some subgroup analysis to see if what type of immunosuppression you are influences the size of the reservoir. Great, thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions, but I'm sure Christine would be happy to answer any if, if people have ones to follow up on uh, after the call. Although I see Dave just turned on his camera. Oh, just to clap. Only to applaud visibly. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much, Christine, for coming. Happy to this. take any questions if you email me. And again, uh, I see Willa on the call who has... <laughs> been the main reason, main person getting many of our candidates to transplant. So please send your patients to Willa and me. We'll, we'll happily get people moved along. Kelly, you're muted. Or it's not muted, but we can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, huge, huge. Thanks, Christine. It was a great presentation. Um, and for any of the students in the room, I know Brian doesn't mind me telling the story, but um, he did this as an undergraduate when he was uh, thinking of going to medical school and the pre-med advisor was not encouraging of him to do it and uh, did this project and landed in Obama's office. And I often use this as a great example of you never know where your research is going to take you. So, um, you know, huge thanks to Dory and everybody for getting him launched, but it's great to see him as successful as he is and to see where this program has gone is just a tremendous, tremendous um, progress. So really great job. Thanks, Kelly. All right, well, well, thanks everybody for coming and thanks so much, Christine and Willa and your whole team for everything that you do. We are in awe of the impact that you have had. So um, have a great Friday, everybody. <laughs>